Everyone, welcome back for part two of the BMW fuel supply problem case study. So, uh, in this case, this is kind of a follow-up, and we'll walk you through the thought process. This car got pretty involved, so I didn't videotape the entire thing, but we'll go through it and finally get to the resolution, and uh, there's quite a few variables here. So first of all, if you remember on the scanner, uh, we saw that the car was shutting off the fuel pump through the control module intentionally. So why is that? Do we have an input problem? First we have to do some reading and educate ourselves on this fuel control system. Low pressure fuel system on the N55 six cylinder uh, direct injected engine. So there's quite a bit of information here. Uh, the key here, what we're after is this fuel pressure sensor on the low pressure side. So remember on the launch, at the end of part one, we saw that that low pressure sensor is reading 98 PSI and that reading was not changing. That is a red flag that, hey, if this sensor is stuck high and the computer sees that value, it's trying to shut off that or lower the amperage of the fuel pump, you know, in the fuel tank to reduce the pressure and it can't do it. So we have a supply issue. So following that logic, we have to test this low pressure sensor. So let's read a little bit. The fuel pressure sensor transmits a voltage signal to the engine management control unit indicating the system pressure between the electric fuel pump and the high pressure pump. Sounds good. It monitors the pressure upstream from the high pressure pump. Uh, the DME, the engine computer, then you know reads that pressure and controls the fuel pump output through the EKPS, the electric fuel pump control, to reduce the voltage to the fuel pump. Okay, so pretty Nothing, nothing too complicated. Uh, so there are the components and you know, keep going here. Everything's good. Makes sense. <laughs> Electric pump, fuel pumps delivery rate is controlled by demand. So there's the fuel pump inside the tank and the fuel pressure sensor. This is the guy we're after. We want to test the output of the sensor. So it's threaded into the fuel supply line. The fuel pressure sensor monitors the pressure. We already know that. Strain gauges. Where does this thing live? We want to get to it and test it. So it's right here. Number four. Let's uh, click on this picture. So right here is our low pressure sensor fuel pressure sensor in the fuel supply line. How do we get to it? So look up some service information. How do we replace this thing? How do we get to it? Well, <laughs> this is where it gets fun. Remove the throttle body. Okay, we have to get our hands dirty. Remove this electrical junction connector. And finally, should be right there in the fuel rail. Okay, you might ask, hey, look up a wiring diagram and see where it connects to the engine computer and just check it there. Okay, sure. Great. You know, if the sensor's hard to get to, then look up a wiring diagram. This is a redrawn diagram here. Top of engine, low pressure fuel sensor, and the three wires here go to our engine computer. Where is the engine computer? Right rear of engine compartment. And this guy was also buried kind of under the intake manifold almost. So either way, you have to remove a whole bunch of stuff to do any checks on this low pressure sensor. We did that. Um, then, you know, the shop owner's like, no problem. We can remove the throttle body. We took it off and we could not find the damn sensor. You looked at the whole fuel rail coming to the high pressure pump. That sensor was nowhere to be found. We have pictures. We, we even went to the OEM, you know, like Nutis, 
info. We have the exact same pictures. The sensor is right there in the picture. It should be there. What the heck? And we notice that, hey, this contraption here, this is a rotary style direct injection pump, was not there. Instead we had a plunger type. And after more digging, this was, I mean, we visited this car three times. You know, the first time uh, was part one. Then later that day, in the evening, we stopped by together with Keith, did more research on this thing. It, the service information was not matching up to what we had on the car. Just crazy. There's no sensor there. So, what does that lead you to believe? This is a different setup. They use two different type uh, of setups here on this <laughs> model BMW and the service information only shows one of them. So anyways, okay, so now we don't have a sensor. That value has to be a substituted value. Talk about going down a rabbit hole. That, <laughs> that's just crazy. So the final conclusion is, hey, this module, the fuel pump module, needs to be programmed. Not just coded. Launch can't do it. So, yep, uh, Keith had to bring out the big guns, the, uh, the auto logic, and he was kind enough to record a video. Again, this is the third visit to the car. He was there with uh, Steve from Simply Diagnostics, and they finally got it done. Again, it was not a short, easy process uh, to program a simple little module in a BMW. You have to go through hoops, and uh, I'll post his uh, clip right after this, so enjoy. Right, so as a follow-up to Ivan's video, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to finish up one part of it here that was left unknown. So as of right now, we have the fuel supply uh, code that's up there right now showing up on the dash. Battery maintainer is already on. It says 14.2, even though it does that funny LED thing that, uh, that it likes to do on camera. And we have our ignition on, and we're bringing out the Autologic Drive Pro. So for those of you that didn't uh, see everything they did on here, I'm just going to go into drive real quick and just show you one of the codes or the codes that it was actually setting in there. Fault codes were showing in here, control voltage too low, and EKPS control current. I'm sure he's already given you enough information on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back out and we're going to go into CIP. Now CIP is our coding individualization and programming in BMW world. When I come in here and I do this, I'm going to hit I accept. Now, yesterday evening, we went in there and we built up what's called a measures plan. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, I'll show you what that is. Right now, we're going to check. Yes, we do have our F, F chassis cable on here. Because it has so many modules and it reads at a high speed, that's one of the things that's there. And it says here, a measures plan has already been created for this vehicle. Do I want to load the current measures plan? Yes, that's actually the one we created last night. So we'll let that load. Creating that measures plan, by the way, is nothing more than simply hitting a button. And it says, do you want to create one? And you hit yes, and then you wait a little while. So you haven't missed anything. We'll wait for it to come up. And when they say several minutes, they do mean it could possibly take up to several minutes. However, I don't think that's going to be the case, though, because we don't have a large measure plan here. So this should go relatively quick. But of course, I said that, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> One of the key things when you're doing this, by the way, is make sure that your driver's side seatbelt is clipped in. You do not want it to go into a power uh, power mode there where it says, well, the key's been on for a while, the guy's not doing anything, let's turn this down so we don't hurt the battery. So, actually, they just disconnected our power support out there. See, something to watch out for when you notice that. So we got Steve over there investigating to see what happened to our power supply. 
that's probably the reason why this thing went a little bit slower than normal but so that you can see here one of the things when we pulled up a measures plan on there is that the actual EKPS was never programmed so we have to do a programming right it's gonna what well, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna back up all the data that's already on there then it's gonna come in here and it's gonna do a programming on the EKPS then it's going to come in here and it's going to do a coding and then it's going to restore the original original data there kind of like what chrysler does with the network configuration not exactly right but that's about it um but now we're pretty well to be safe back in business uh hopefully the clod hopper feet won't get near there again and we should be safe to go so let's clear out of that and once we do that we can come in here and hit start measures plan and remove all the uh, other items there anything at all that's uh, ipod flash drives anything like that it's going to read the preconditions it's going to back up the individual data it's going to prepare it for programming and it should move pretty quick because again it's a small module very limited number of instructions that it'll require wait for that to go I figure Ivan can edit this later if you'd like. Instead of staring at that little bar, maybe you'll see it go whoop. <laughs> but it's preparing the vehicle now. You hear the chimes. You now, sometimes what you'll see is modules will go into a sleep mode and then it'll start its programming. So, what it's really doing right now is it's turning things down off of the bus. So that way there's not as much communication on the bus. It kind of puts guys to sleep and says, all right, just give us a minute. Let us converse back and forth and not interrupt the scan tool. Now the beauty of this is that we're doing a single module programming, we're not doing the entire vehicle. Does it hurt to do the entire vehicle? No, but this is a single module, this is the only thing that we have to deal with right now, so we'll work with this and, uh, and we'll get things going. One module at a time. Notice that in the CIP report it also didn't show anything else in there that said anything else needed to be updated. Normally it will. It'll tell me what else, what other updates are available. Sometimes it'll tell me what TSPs are relative. And in this case here, this car must have been to the dealer pretty recently because uh, not very often you hop into one of these things and there's not a whole list of modules to program or update. Isn't that right, Steve? It, it certainly is, mate. It certainly <laughs> is. Getting tired out there on the Staten Island Express, are you? <laughs> mate, no, I could do this all day, every day. It's so much fun. Beautiful. Ultimate skills test it is. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. My pleasure. Let's see here, finalizing the ECU programming. Which doesn't mean we're actually done, as you can tell. We're only at step 5 of 16. The rest of the steps are generally pretty quick. This one takes a little while. And there goes step 6. And sub step two, three, four, five. There's a chime to tell us that we're moving on. So the programming portion of it is done. Now it's going to do a coding. This is, I guess you could call it the handshake. Everyone's going to agree at this point now that a new module has been installed. You'll see odd things happen, by the way. See things like that, DSC and X drive. Don't worry about it. At the end of all this, when we restore the configuration, everyone's going to be happy again. May have to clear a few codes, but this should get us right where we want to be. So it's deactivating coding mode. Still deactivating coding mode. That just went back to its beginning display, which means that we've already completed one portion of it. 
So what it's doing probably here is it's probably telling each one of the modules one at a time that it's time to stop coding mode. It's going to restore the individual data, clearing the fall codes. So it's doing that for us, which is nice. We won't have to go jumping around to do that. But of course, we'll check it one more time. It's going to give an updated report on it and a security key alignment. And there's the horn. Turn off the air addiction, allow it to assume sleep mode. And the final this report will be displayed after that. Okay. We'll wait for sleep mode. Sleep mode, one of the ways you can tell, by the way, is look at the start stop button and wait for the little light in here to go out, which it won't focus, but there it is. But if you cover that up there and you wait for that start stop button to finally go to sleep, that's your that's there where you're actually in a sleep mode. Now keep watching for that. We've got Ivan out there right now and we're giving him a couple of cars to do. Little does he realize though, I just sent him the message now that said, Hey Ivan, you have six left. And uh, his first answer to me was, holy moly. <laughs> we've, yeah. we've tested him, haven't we, mate? We've definitely <laughs> tested him with some of the cars that we've sent him out on. And I'm sure the videos are, are going to be uh, rolling in for all of you. Yeah. And I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, some of the cars that I gave him yesterday there were uh, a test of the metal, for oh, sure. Cruelty, that was. That's, <laughs> it really was. So here's our start stop. As you can see, the lights went out, so we know we're in sleep mode now. Nothing up on the dash. Don't go by the dash. I'm going to tell you that now. Use that start-stop button because that'll fool you. This will stay on sometimes, depending upon whether or not the door is open. And this will be out, and you're already in sleep mode. So after we do that, we'll hit here, and then we have our completed report. Programming and coding has been done. The clearing of the fall codes has been done. Total time, they say... Five minutes. I don't think so. I got 10 minutes on the clock already. So uh, I guess that's German time. BMW time. And no wonder their flat rate is so expensive. Never mind. <laughs> Anyhow, so let's go ahead and turn that key back on, on again. And remember that when we did that before, I believe we had fuel pump error that would show up on here. So let's see if Ivan was right. Fingers crossed for Ivan. <laughs> It's gonna make us stare at BMW for a moment, I'm sure. Come on now, give us the good stuff. We'll accept that, so he moves on. No check faults yet. Let's start this baby up. No other checks. Looking pretty good so far. Snap that throttle for him. Listen to that turbo spooling up, huh? Ooh. Ooh, that sounds good. That's that raw BMW power right there. This thing's got to have at least like 46 horsepower or something like that. Yeah. All right, well, we're looking good, right? No fuel pump codes up there, nothing that's showing up. And I will let Ivan finish out the rest of this. And uh, looks like he did a great job here. So once again, uh, this video is going to be up on Ivan's channel and just an add, add, just so we can add it into what he's already done. So I hope you enjoyed the case study, cars fixed, and what are the lessons here? A lot of lessons to be learned. You know, even if the thought process is there, what can hold you back? The information availability and specialty tools. You know, to fix this car, either A, send it to a dealer, or you have to buy, what, a $30,000 tool and the subscriptions to download the files, to flash these things. So, my heart really goes out to Keith. I mean, he is, you know, he has these tools, he invests in it, and he really knows his stuff. Never flustered. It's, he says, it's only a machine, we can fix it. So, Keith, 
<laughs> you are <laughs> my number one role model and it's really, I'm really humbled to have you as a mentor. Um, man, uh, it's really, really, the new level, that, that, that's what it is. So, hope you guys enjoyed that case study, definitely more to come, really appreciate everyone watching and have a fantastic day, see you on the next one, bye bye.